Hello, uh, I'm Devangshu Mukherjee. I am a postdoc at the High Energy Theory Group at Kaiser Trivandrum. And uh, starting from today, I will be offering this course on uh, quantum mechanics, which will aim to cover uh, the basic aspects that are taught in a typical first course in uh, quantum mechanics in an advanced uh, undergraduate curriculum. Uh, before I actually start with the actual material of the course, uh, uh, there are certain aspects, I mean, of the, of the course, including the way, the, the kind of material that I will be covering, and the where I will be covering, that I want to clear up uh, before I actually jump into the actual subject. So, uh, it, 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 is, it is quite well known uh, to all of us that uh, classical theory has, has certain limitations, uh, especially when one tries to describe microscopic properties of matter. Uh, that is where uh, beyond a certain scale, we know uh, classical mechanics fail, which is familiar to most of us uh, from our school days. Uh, also, quantum mechanics is in some aspects uh, richer theory in terms of scope and applicability. Uh, now, the thing is that if uh, you look at a typical uh, quantum mechanics textbook, uh, you will see, see a, a bunch of textbooks actually follows and at least begins with a sort of historical viewpoint. And typically, it, it talks about the way the subject actually developed. So, uh, in, in fact, in fact, so, so let me just uh, start out explicitly by writing points that I have been saying. Um, sorry. So, Classical mechanics has limitations. And of course, as I was saying, QM is richer in terms of scope. Sorry. scope and applicability. So uh, as I was saying that if you look at uh, typical treatment of uh, quantum mechanics, uh, one generally, and, and to be honest, th 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 there is nothing right or wrong about the way uh, one would like to study this, uh, but, but one typically uh, goes by this historical approach where uh, first uh, we are taught about, uh, so, so historically the way in fact quantum mechanics came up is, uh, you know, from the early works of Planck, namely first people learn about Planck's radiation law, uh, followed by einstein Debye theory of specific heat. einstein Debye theory Sorry. Then uh, you have, of course, the Bohr atom. Um, followed by the works of de Broglie. And along with uh, these historical, uh, along with these theoretical developments, of course, there were these brilliant experimental developments which were also going on in the site, uh, done by Compton. Uh, then uh, you have the Frank Hertz experiment. Frank and Hertz. And you also have the famous Davison Germer uh, Thompson experiment. Uh, and, and, and 
as the subject developed historically, mostly in the first three decades of the 20th century, uh, the masters of this subject, they took various wrong turns. There were a lot of hiccups during the process of development, but ultimately the masters of this subject, they eventually formulated and gave us a consistent mathematical description of quantum mechanics as we know it today. Uh, our approach will be very much to reach the heart of that, to develop and understand quantum mechanics in a very quantum mechanical way, so that at the end of the day, we can understand the mathematics behind it and also perform computations. So in some sense, I'm sort of appealing to the very basic uh, way of scientific development. That is, we will look at a bunch of experiments. We will be making certain assumptions. Based on those assumptions, we will be postulating. Based on those postulates, we will make some predictions. If the predictions do not agree with the experiment, then our assumptions must be wrong. Uh, this is the way we would actually try to try and, and, and is in, a, in, a, in a very axiomatic way, try to develop this subject. And also uh, in the later lectures, I will introduce the formalism. Uh, so let me just mention here that our main aim will be to get Sorry, um, to get introduced to a quantum mechanical way of thinking, as I would like to put it. Uh, and this is what we want to get to pretty fast. Uh, the next slide. Uh oh. Um, okay. So, uh, most of the books, as you would see, actually follows this historical perspective. However, there are the, the, the main textbook that I would be following is, is something which actually does this job very nicely, which in fact, uh, in fact straight away jumps into the, 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 I would say the juice of the subject uh, within the first few pages. Uh, so the book that I would be following is Change color here. Of course, uh, you know there is there is nothing sacred about following this particular book. So one is more than welcome to follow whichever author one likes the most, and so on. Uh, but the main text that I would be following is uh, by Sakurai. And for the formalism part, where I would start developing the formalism, which will basically start from the second lecture. Um, the formalism aspect, and in fact, certain aspects later also would be from Dirac's book on quantum mechanics. So in fact, Dirac has two books. One is Lectures on Quantum Mechanics, another is Introduction to Quantum Mechanics. I'm referring to the longer one. Introduction to quantum mechanics. Um, other than that, of course, there are other references, uh, beautiful references that one can follow. Um, so some of them that I would like to mention is uh, definitely there's this beautiful two-volume work by Ohintanaji. you and Lalo. Um, then there is, of course,
Mas bacana. Uh, and the classic textbook of Shiv. So again, to reiterate, this will be the main text. This will be the main text. And uh, certain aspects will be picked up as and when needed from uh, Dirac's book. And the others are the references. Okay. So uh, the, the, the material that I plan to cover roughly spans over the first three chapters of Sakurai. So uh, the goal will be to, to, to roughly cover the first three chapters uh, of Sakurai over the next uh, 25 to 30 lectures. And uh, uh, topic wise, uh, the, the formalism part, introducing the formalism, etc., and the bracket notation, uh, which is which is which was primarily worked by Dirac. That would take a bunch of time. Uh, followed by uh, the part of dynamics, where we will be talking about time evolution operator, the two kinds of pictures, the Heisenberg and the Schrodinger picture. Uh, then we will talk about uh, the quantum harmonic oscillator. Uh, then we will look at certain elementary wave equation solutions, um, uh, uh, Schrodinger wave equation solutions. And finally, we will end with a discussion on angular momentum. I just want to add angular momentum, cleft Gordon coefficients. And maybe over time later, uh, if time permits, provided time permits, uh, we will talk a bit about symmetries in quantum mechanics. So uh, that is roughly what uh, I had to say regarding these, these uh, other non-academic sort of aspects of this course. Uh, so, so let us straight away jump into now the, the main material. Okay, so okay. so the thing that we will be starting from is actually an experimental setup, which goes by the name of. Stern Gerlach experiment. So this is this this would be our starting point. Uh, this was an experiment performed roughly, I would say, around 1921-22 by Otto Stern and Walter Gerlach in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, so, so let me just tell about the experimental setup first. So, the way it happens is silver atoms are heated up in an organ. And the organ has a small hole through which some of the silver atoms can escape. They are made to pass through a collimator. Uh, so a collimator basically punches together and sends uh, things in a parallel beam. Uh, it passes through a collimator and then it is subjected to a inhomogeneous, so, so yeah, they are heated uh, in an oven, passes through hole, in oven uh, 
and collimator. Uh, and finally, okay, it passes through hole in organ and collimator. Then it is subjected to an inhomogeneous magnetic field and finally whatever comes out is projected onto a screen okay so this inhomogeneous magnetic field is produced by actually a pair of pole pieces a pair of north south pole pieces where one of them has an extremely sharp edge produces this magnetic field magnetic field. And finally, whatever comes out is projected onto a screen so maybe it is better if i if i if i give a more diagrammatic setup uh, so so what we are looking at is is is, is something like this So, so one has something like an oven here. This is the oven that I'm talking about, where the silver atoms gets heated up. It's a hole through which the atom can escape. There is a beam collimator passes through that. So, so, so the job of this collimator is essentially to put things in a bunch. And this beam comes out and passes through, sorry, passes through an inhomogeneous magnetic field. So this is produced, as I was saying, by a magnet which has a very sharp edge. So something like this is present. So something like this is present. This is say the North Pole. And of course, the other end is the South Pole. This is the South Pole. This is basically the inhomogeneous magnetic field. The beam passes through it. Maybe it's better if I draw the beam in a different color. Uh, Possibly, yeah. So 
this is where the beam comes out from. I'm not sure if this is visible enough. Um, this is where. And the question that we are asking is, I'm going to project this onto a screen, that's for sure. The question is, what does one see on the screen? That's the question. So in order to answer this, what one needs to do is, so, so let me mark here, this is the oven, my silver atom circuited. This is the collimator. You have these two are my magnets. And finally, you have here the screen. And this is the B. B silver atoms. Okay. Before we answer what exactly happens when these bunch of silver atoms fall on the screen, what one needs to understand is how exactly or what exactly is the effect of this inhomogeneous magnetic field as the beam passes through it. That's what we need to answer. Right? Okay. So in order to answer that, let us first, what, what we need to look at is the electronic structure of silver. So silver has 47 electrons. Okay. So silver atom has 47 electrons. So if you look at the electronic structure and write it out explicitly, again, following the very standard materials that are taught to us in plus two, you know, of bow, et cetera, et cetera. You will see that this is how it looks like. Two, 18, eight, 18, 18, one. So you have a lone electron sitting in pi s. So, so, so by the way, even this eight means basically two s two to p six. And similarly, 18 would mean three s two, uh, 3p6 and uh, 3d10 and so on. So uh, you have basically a 5s1 electron sitting. Sorry, 5s1 electron just sitting outside. Now, if you look at the remainder 46 electrons, these bunch of 46 electrons, they form something like a spherical electron cloud around the nucleus. Okay. Because of the spherical symmetry of this electron cloud, there is no net angular momentum. So these 46 electrons form a Spherically symmetrical cloud around the nucleus. So no. net angular momentum. Okay. Now, if I ignore nuclear spin, then the atom as a whole does not have any angular momentum except which is, so, so, so the atom does have angular momentum which is provided solely by this pi s one electron, right? So it, it, is, it is completely due to this 46, uh, the 47th electron that the entire atom gets any kind of angular momentum, right? So, so 
And also one should also remember that the nucleus itself is almost 10 to the power five times heavier than the electrons. So to be exact, it is two times 10 to the power five, but we are basically doing an order of magnitude estimate. Uh, the heavy atom as a whole uh, possesses a matter basically the, the, the entire point of this analysis and this argument is to convince that the entire atom as a whole possesses a magnetic moment, which is in fact equal to the spin magnetic moment of this particular 47th electron sitting in type S1, right? So, so uh, the, of course, these are very crude approximations, but the point is that even in spite of such crude approximations, the, the results and, 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 and the entire analysis will work out really fine. And actually, you just want a very nice uh, formalism for quantum mechanics, at least, at least motivate a, a quantum mechanical uh, picture in, in, in your mind. So the magnetic moment of the full atom is equal to the spin magnetic moment of the 5s1 electron. Okay. So to be more precise, so the atom mu is in fact proportional to S. Yes. Uh, to, to, so, 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 in fact, the proportionality constant, if you really replace, it's roughly equal to E by M E times C. So, oh, okay. Also, by the way, for the entirety of this course, so E is in fact less than zero. And this will be the convention that I will be following for the entirety of this course. So for me, electronic charge is always something negative. Okay. So uh, this is roughly the proportionality constant in front. M is the mass of electron, C is the speed of light. And in fact, this approximation is in fact, in fact, this is accurate by almost 0.2% to the actual exponential value. Okay. So now having explained the setup and motivated the fact that the entire atomic angular momentum can be thought of as something that contributes, that, 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 that is coming solely from that of the 47th 5s1 electron, we are now in good shape. We can now actually go ahead and do some analysis. Now recall that we are subjecting this to an inhomogeneous magnetic field. But again, this magnetic field if you look at the diagram, so so this is my z direction. So this is my z direction. It is directed solely in this direction. And that is going to be our assumption. That is the components along bx or by, that is along the horizontal plane is roughly negligible. So if that is really the case, then the force that is being exerted on every such atom, the z component, turns out to be then L Z of mu dot B, where mu dot B is essentially the interaction energy, right? And since I'm going to neglect the Bx and By components, this is approximately mu Z times del Bz del Z. 
again to reiterate just point out here and okay okay so this is the force along the z direction that every electron that passes in between those magnetic states so depending on whether mu z is greater than 0 or less than 0 we are going to have either the force will be upward directed or downward directed so if mu z is greater than 0 that is sz is less than 0 this is true because as i was pointing out according to my convention e is negative so if you look at this formula when we mu z is greater than 0 uh, s will be less than 0 so this is going to give me a upward force and correspondingly when mu z is less than zero that is when sz is greater than zero the atom is going to feel a downward tug okay so what this essentially is doing is it is splitting so 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 what is the entire point of this experiment it splits this beam of silver atoms that comes in according to values of mu z or it splits the beam according to values of s z up to some numerical factor which is sitting in front of them, right so the question is what would you expect on the screen that was the original question that we wanted to ask now this object mu z that can take any possible value between mod mu to minus mod mu. Sorry, so you can see my space here. So that can actually take any value between minus mod mu. plus mod okay now you would likely expect so 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 all values of mu z within this range can be realized right now the expectation would be that the beam would naturally be evenly spread over all possible such mu z values that is if this is the screen so this is where the beam is coming from This is what one would expect. This would be the distribution of the atoms that are hitting the screen. This is expectation. However, the reality is something else. In reality, what you see is not such a broad distribution, but you simply see two dots on the screen. So your electrons are either here or here. Sorry, since I'm drawing on the screen, you know, there is there is nothing special about the heights of these towers that I've drawn. But, uh, so you this is so 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 this is this is what the reality is you end up with just two dots so clearly 
So clearly our classical intuition definitely gets you. So classical intuition fails. So how can we go about uh, rectifying this in time right so let me also point out numerically what one observes is that this value of sz if i evaluate this numerically sz turns out to be roughly equal to h cut by 2 where h cut is approximately 1.05 times 10 to the power minus 27. Sorry. Of seconds or 6.85 times 10 to the power minus 16 electron volt seconds. It's a simple ex exercise to convert between these two. Uh, the thing is that also one should notice that there is nothing sacred about uh, us polarizing this along SZ or anything. We could have done the same exercise for sx uh, for, 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 for the x direction or the y direction. I mean, I could have I could have made the beam pass along x direction, uh, gave a transverse magnetic field along the y direction, and it would have split into uh, sy plus and sy minus components. So 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 okay. Um, the the okay. So the upward component, the one that has been obtained here, this is what I'm referring to as sz plus. And this is what I'm referring to as Sz minus. So we have, we have essentially ended up with, we have ended up with sort of uh, two spots, up and down orientation. And these are the only possible values it seems you can take. Uh, in the very early days of quantum mechanics, actually this phenomena was called space quantization. And uh, in fact, uh, this experiment actually has a very beautiful uh, story, which involves uh, bad cigar and a railway strike. Uh, in fact, in fact, there is a, a, a beautiful article. I would, in fact, it's, it, it's a very nice, chill read and a very fun read uh, by Friedrich and Hirschbach, which uh, I will I will leave the link in the des description. Um, I think it came out in Physics Today sometime in two thousand three. So. Um, so a very nice read by Friedrich and Hirschbach on the on the story of how uh, these two gentlemen, uh, Otto Stern and Walter Gerlach, finally were able to do their experiment and. They interpreted it. Uh, so, 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 this is basically the 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 original experiment as was done by Stern and Gerlach. Your classical intuition fails. You pass a bunch of silver atoms through this inhomogeneous magnetic field. Instead of seeing seeing a uniform distribution on screen, you simply see two spots. Basically, basically, music can take only two values. Now, what's the next step? The next step 
is something that is known as sequential Sternberg line, which in fact throws the peculiarity of quantum mechanics right at your face. Okay, let's look at it. So now we are looking at sequential Sternberg. So the name might sound fancy, but essentially at the end, what we are doing is we are placing the Sternberg apparatuses which splits your beings generally into two components through a sequence of such stronger like apparatuses. Okay, so we, we place stronger like apparatus in sequence and we make the beam pass through more than one such apparatus and see what we, we finally get. So we will be in particular looking at three possible cases. Let us look at them one by one. So, let me first denote certain conventional aspect. So if you know, look at a box and see there written S, G, Z hat, it means that the inhomogeneous magnetic field that I am providing is along the Z direction, which means the beam is moving either in the X or Y direction. And essentially what is happening is it is splitting things in SZ plus and SZ minus components. So some beam is coming in through like this and it is basically splitting. So this is going to be our notation. Okay. So Let us now look at the first case. So I have an oven here. Silver atoms coming out. They are passing through. Stronger like apparatus with magnetic field along the Z direction. So it's going to produce two beams. What I'm going to do is I'm going to block one of the beams. I'm not going to let it go through. So this is my SZ minus beam. The SZ plus beam is made to go through another Sternberg like apparatus, which again has an inhomogeneous magnetic field along the z direction. What comes out is a sz plus. There is no sz minus component. And for a second, you would say, well, that makes sense. You know, I just passed to my first apparatus. It ejected for me two kinds of components, 50% SZ plus, 50% SZ minus. I already took them away and threw them out right here. I threw them out. And if I pick up only the SZ plus component and again make them pass through a strong delay apparatus, of course, it's not going to give me out any kind of SZ minus because I don't have to throw them away. So, no surprise. This did not throw. No surprises. Okay. So we are happy. Case uh, two. 
again we start with the number which i mark simply as o silver atoms coming out passes through my first turn galak apparatus which always will be along the z direction again gives me two beams i block the z minus beam and i keep the z plus beam this time around i make it go through sg x hat so my magnetic field is now along the x direction so sg x hat what would it do is it is going to take any beam and polarize it along so so it is going to give me two beams one sx plus one sx minus exactly similar to what stone gel like z did but in different direction so what you end up getting is sx plus and sx minus now your natural intuition would say okay i started out with a bunch of beams what i did was i took away the sz minus i threw them away sz plus is remaining of course but then i'm projecting but then i'm passing it through stone gel apparatus which is supposed to characterize sx plus and sx minus so intuitive intuitively what you believe is 50% of the particles are characterized by sz plus and sx plus whereas other 50% is characterized by sz plus and sx minus that would be the most intuitive thing to say right fine let us assume that's the case now let us go to the third possible case Uh, okay here again i start with an oven i pass through stone the like said i get two beams as the minus gets blocked as the plus passes through I subject it to now. Stern Gerlach X hat. Again, I get two beams. This time around, I block the S X minus. So there is no S X minus. So I have a S X plus component going up here. This now I put into another Stern Gerlach apparatus. which has magnetic field z and this is where for the first time we see a non trivial peculiarity of quantum mechanics what comes out is both sz plus and sz minus now had our assumption been true and we really thought that you know we have got sz minus eliminated right at this step but the point is that sz minus still comes back here so clearly the assumption that both these particles were characterized exclusively by sz plus was not exactly true really somewhere the properties the, the, the characteristics of sz minus were still hidden so the only thing is that possibly what is happening is 
that the selection of this SX plus by the second apparatus destroys any previous information about SZ. In fact, in fact, so, so, so what are the central takeaways from the case three is that the assumption that we let SZ plus and SX plus be in the third apparatus is wrong. This is simply wrong. And what that means is that selection of SX plus by second apparatus destroys any previous information information about as said, the thing is that you should not be under the impression that this is some limitation of the experimenter. However good or however sophisticated you make your experimental setup, there is no way you can ever make the last SZ minus beam that comes out from the third apparatus completely vanish. Rather, this is a limitation of the inherent microscopic property of the matter. It is an inherent peculiarity of the apparatus. So our goal would be now to put this on a more firmer quantitative basis and try to understand exactly how we can formulate or, or, or make up a make up postulates and a mathematical framework in order to explain such phenomena. Okay. So in order to do that, we would actually appeal to something classical. We will try to take an analogy from light, rather polarization of light. So this will, the, the, the main goal, the, the, the main reason for doing this is that it will help us in developing a mathematical framework for the postulates of quantum mechanics, right? So, analogy with polarization of light. Okay, so we will consider, so excite polarized light is produced by an oscillating electric field, which is given by an expression like this. is basically E naught cos Kz minus omega T and you have X hat. So the wave is propagating, the, 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 the light is propagating along that direction. T is of course the time like coordinate, omega is the frequency and X hat basically signifies the fact that it is polarized along X direction. 
Similarly, if I had y, y, a y polarized line, instead of x hat, I would have written a y hat. As simple as that. Uh, such kind of lights, as you probably know, this can be produced by a polaroid filter. Can be produced by polaroid filter. Okay. Now, okay, this is also quite natural that if this is say X filter, uh, uh, say, 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 uh, X filter, a Y filter is nothing but a X filter which is rotated by 90 degrees. If I put a X filter and a Y filter in sequence and pass light through both of them, I would end up here with no beam of light. In fact, keeping in analogy with our recently concluded stern girl act discussion, let me also represent here with boxes where, okay, let me use different colors when I'm talking about light. So for light, let me use white so this means this is x polarized this is y polarized and no b now however so so with light one can do one can think of this as case a However, if I use a setup as follows, that I pass normal light first through X, then I pass it through another, which I'm going to call X prime, which is nothing but 45 degree rotated filter and then Y, which is a 90 degree rotated filter. What you are going to see is that there is a beam. Now, this is something which is very, very much in analogy with our uh, stone like experiment. In fact, one can say, in keeping in analogy with our stone like experiment, this presence of X prime filter is what makes the beam forget about the fact that it was at some point in the past polarized by an X filter. Pictorially, if I'm looking from the front, then if this is my x direction, this is my y direction, then this is going to be my x prime and this is going to be my y prime directions. So in order to indicate x and y prime, let me use double arrows. Now, this entire setup seems very, very similar to the Sturm-Gallag situation, provided we make a direct correspondence. The correspondence being if I identify SZ plus minus to be X and Y polarized light, then SX plus minus can be thought of as X prime and Y prime polarized light. This is the first analogy that we make. Now, had we been working with these light beams, what would have been, I mean, what on, on a more stricter basis, what would have been the mathematical analysis that we would have done? What we would have done is, to be more concrete, 
the x prime polarized light can be represented by an oscillating electric field of this form. So you have your x hat. This is nothing but one by square root two. So argument goes here. Z minus omega t. You have your x hat plus not by square root two. Cos k z minus omega t. Y hat. Similarly, I would have got not cos k z minus omega t y hat to be equal to minus e naught by square root two. Cos k z minus omega t x hat plus e naught by square root two. The same thing basically times y hat. Okay, uh, let me actually copy this and take it to the next page while reading this. Right. So these were the exact way uh, we can think of as polarization in a more quantitative way. So what exactly is happening in the context of light? When So at the very beginning, the light beam goes through a X filter and I end up with a X polarized light. So this light is X polarized. But what you notice from the above equation is that X is nothing but a linear combination of, sorry, uh, this is wrong actually. This is actually X prime and Y prime. So this is going to be X prime and y prime, even in the earlier slide also. This is going to be x prime and y prime. Uh, the, 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 these transformations are actually very trivial to find out. I mean, you can simply look at, observe that this angle is nothing but 45 degrees and cos 45 is one by root and that's how you get these factors of one by root. That I've heard of here. It's just a, this is just a rotation transformation, that's it. Um, so coming back to here, once I get X polarized light, I am encountered with the X prime filter. So the X prime filter is supposed to give me, is supposed to keep only things which are in the X prime direction, X hat prime direction, which now happens to be a linear combination of X and Y. So, so, so this X polarized light, is in fact, in turn, a combination of, this is a linear combination of X hat prime and Y hat prime. My X prime filter picks up only one of the components. But again, X prime hat is a linear combination of X prime, uh, is a linear combination of X hat and Y hat. So when I again pass it through the third X hat filter, it is going to give me something non-zero and there will be some light coming out of the Y filter. Now, if I apply the same correspondence in the context of the Stern-Gerlach experiments, 
the speed states so so uh, so what we do is apply the lesson from polarization of light vision to stronger light. So the spin states can be thought of as some very abstract vectors in some very abstract movie space, vector space. This vector space is different from your regular xy space. And this is not, in fact, your regular two-dimensional xy space. But one can think of this 2D vector space being spanned by the basis vectors Sz plus and Sz minus. Which are nothing but analogs of x hat and y hat. And similarly, Sx minus and Sx plus are analogs of x prime hat and y prime hat. This is the first time you encounter a notation like this. So these are basically known as anything which, 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 in fact, from now on, sorry. So objects that look like this are known as gets. And this is a notation which was introduced by Dirac. We will be exploring more about these notations in the subsequent lectures. Uh, and taking inspiration from our example of polarization, what we say is that these vectors, they are some very abstract objects as of now, are nothing but linear combinations. So my Sx plus is a linear combination, exactly analogous to what we did for polarization vector. I'm going to write it as Sz minus. Similarly, Sx minus is going to be minus of one by square root two, Sz plus, plus one by square root two, Sz minus. Okay, now you can understand, and this basically gives you the reason why in the third case of stern gerlach experiment, we still ended up with two components, because look at what Sx plus here is. If you recall, the setup was, there was oven, in fact, uh, let me just copy it from earlier pages. So this was case three. And this was our experimental setup. Which as you can see, now you see that indeed, in spite of passing it through this, a generic Sx plus is nothing but a linear combination of both Sz plus and Sz minus which is what explains why, in spite of blocking the so-called SZ minus in the case of the first turn apparatus, 
we still ended up with both the possible beams coming out from the curve. Okay. Now comes an obvious question. Fine. We have indeed classified SZ plus and SZ minus to be basis vectors of some abstract two dimensional vector space. The SX plus and SX minus happens to be linear combinations of the SZ plus and SZ minus. What about SY plus and SY minus? So the question that we are asking now is, what about SY plus minus? Again, like before, one should note that there is nothing sacred in the z direction. We could have as well have done the entire analysis with SY and what we are so-called calling SX right now could have been called as SY. So in short, SY plus minus would continue to be some linear combination of SZ plus and SZ minus. But now you would question that, you know, by defining relations, you know, I had a vector space with two possible basis vectors. And so, so doesn't this exhaust all possible linear combinations that one can write with Z plus and Z minus? Again, here, our light analogy can come to our rescue. Now, in this case, to understand SY plus minus states, consider circularly polarized light beam. So consider, circularly polarized light beam. So these can be obtained by using a quarter wave plate. And once it passes through an X or Y filter, it gives me either X polarized light or Y polarized light with equal intensity. However, it is very different in the sense that if I write down the corresponding electric field, we see that it is given by So the Y component has an additional phase of 90 degrees here in the case of circularly polarized light. Now, if I use the simple formula and identify I to be e to the power I pi by two, and I introduce the notation that the real part of this vector epsilon is nothing but the vector E divided by E naught, then one can write this field capital E vector as I kz minus omega t x hat plus I by square root two, and this is important, the factor of I, so, of course, I am not showing the explicit derivation here, and I would definitely urge everyone to work this out in details, at least for the people who are seeing this for the first time. Once I write it this way, I can immediately draw the analogy that SY plus is right circularly polarized. Whereas SY minus is left circularly polarized light. The central takeaway in this analysis is, however, the fact so, 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 correspondingly, the way we are going to represent SY plus minus is. going to be one by square root two of SZ plus, so this is two, is going to be plus minus, plus or minus, I by square root two SZ 
minus. So, uh, as I have been saying, uh, the main point here is that the SY vector, uh, as we as we described, can actually have complex coefficients, and this is the central takeaway that 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 is there in, in this entire lesson that the vectors that span this so-called abstract two-dimensional vector space can combine with complex coefficient in front. So an arbitrary vector if one wants to write down within this vector space will be a linear combination of the basis vectors SZ plus and SZ minus with complex coefficients. And that's the central ticket. So even for a very simple enough problem like this, what sees what, what one sees is that you, you can you can you can easily see that it, it, you, you require complex numbers in order to fully describe the system. Now uh, from the next lecture onwards, we would move on and make this entire formalism much more mathematically rigorous, much more concrete. We would get introduced to the postulates of quantum mechanics, and we would also definitely develop on this notation as was introduced by Dirac, which is one of the bracket notation. So we will introduce ket vectors, bra vectors, operators as Dirac did, and then proceed with and proceed further uh, with a robust mathematical formulation. Now, regarding the derivation that we did right now, uh, I want to point out that at no point when we were drawing this analogy between polarization of light and these uh, so-called quantum states, did I actually take into account the quantum nature of light itself? Uh, of course, so, 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 so at no point did I talk about single photon and polarization state of single photons. Of course, one can go into such detailed analysis. I think Byam's book does an excellent job, I think, in the beginning. Byam has a, uh, it, it's a good source and one can of course read that up. Uh, but in spite of that, just simply by looking at the classical analog of polarization vector, we have actually recovered so much. And at least I hope this has given the flavor and feel of how non-intuitive and how sharply different from classical mechanics. So hopefully next time um, we will continue with uh, introduction to the bracket notation and 